Greetings and welcome, friends, to our final week of our SENT seminar. This is week four, where we'll be focusing on forging a new path as we continue to gather around our larger theme, changing the narrative, the power of storytelling. My name is Reverend Darnell Fennell, and I'm joined by Reverend Ashley Mayhem. I serve as MBA Social Entrepreneurship Program Coordinator. Um, and this week's theme is forging a path. And so uh, if you've watched and uh, zoomed in on, on the last few weeks of this overall theme of the changing the narrative, um, you'll see we've kind of tracked uh, the different paths and the different aspects of that journey of forging a new path. And so we have some voices uh, joining us today who have uh, brought some wisdom and some of their experience. Um, we have with us Reverend Pedro Ramos and Reverend Alsa Gonzalez. They provided the workshop responding to the need. Reverend Pedro is pastor of the Lehman Christian Church community. Pedro and his wife migrated from Sonora, Mexico to the United States to start a Hispanic church in Sarita, Arizona. And the Reverend Elsa serves as the pastor of First Christian Church in Tucson, Arizona. She has a passion for social justice and creating paths of wholeness for individuals and communities. She's also served as a missionary in Honduras in El Salvador, working with marginalized communities in urban and rural settings. And we're grateful for their work and their presence this evening, we're also joined by Reverend Kendall Brown, who offered the workshop Responding to the Call, and he is a minister, entrepreneur, former seminary admissions director, and former denominational staff for the Central Atlantic Conference of UCC. And in 2016, if you watched his workshop and his story, uh, after years of sensing uh, a deep desire to reconnect with his creative self, Kendall became a candle maker, uh, later launching his own company, and in seven short years, 228 Grant Street Candle Company has been featured on the ABC World News, the Today Show, and in numerous national publications and carried by national retailers such as J. Crew. As a director of our social entrepreneurship program here at MBA it gives me great joy just to be able to connect with so many great leaders and entrepreneurs over the last four weeks. And as a way of closing us out, uh, we've heard our panelists and now we will hear introduction of our keynote speaker today, Reverend Dr. Melva L. Sampson is the Assistant Professor of Preaching and Practical Theology at Wake Forest University School of Divinity. She's an ordained minister of the Progressive National Baptist Convention and an ordained ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church USA. Her research interests live at the intersection of gender, digital interactive media, performance, and preaching. She is the creator and the curator of Pink Robe Chronicles, a digital hush harbor that centers faith and spirituality, utilizing the womanist tenets of redemptive self-love critical engagement, radical subjectivity, and traditional communalism to, to uh, eludicate the role of sacred memory and ritual in the collective healing of marginalized communities. Let's welcome our keynote speaker this evening, Reverend Dr. Melva L. Sampson. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Reverend Ashley Mayhem and Reverend Darnell Fennell and to all of the other um, esteemed panelists. Um, I count you as colleagues in doing this work. It is wonderful to be with each of you. Um, before I move forward, I must shout out um, our community, uh, Village Keepers. Uh, so shout out to the Pink Robe Chronicles uh, and to the Clearing uh, to each of you, I am grateful for your presence, um, for um, the work that we do together. I want to um, frame my conversation as this 
uh, will move forward very much like a PRC, a Pink Rope Chronicles meditation, which you can find every Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern time, uh, both here on Facebook and on YouTube. And that means that I will be looking both uh, at two screens. My, my movement will be one way and then to the phone as I am looking and engaging with those who are on live back and forth um, is the way that we engage uh, in our particular village that we might um, just be in constant conversation and community together. And for those of you who participate in a virtual space often, you know that there's some good stuff. There's There are good things uh, shared in the chat. So the first part of my keynote, I want to frame um, around this notion um, that is rooted in um, what Professor uh, Givens identifies as fugitive pedagogy, fugitive pedagogy. Um, I'm going to speak about it in a second, but the, the, the part that strikes me most that I want to frame uh, these part of my remarks is around stealing possession of my own life, stealing possession of my own life. The pulpit is a traditional site of knowledge production in the black church and historically cisgender heterosexual males have been considered chief generators of that knowledge. Conversely, black preaching women's ability to confront and critically engage hegemony is not solely lodged in the physical location of the pulpit. Black preaching women have lived between dynamism and tenderness being vocal about certain lived experiences and expected to be silent about others. In August, 2016, I went live on Facebook for the first time, responding to news that yet another black person, this time a young woman, was killed by law enforcement was unsettling. Subsequently, around the same time, the senior male pastor at the church I attended shared with me that a female parishioner was dissatisfied with my pulpit presence and demanded that I know no longer be allowed to preach. What started out as curiosity quickly burgeoned into a commitment. Facebook had recently introduced the, li the live feature, the ability to record live interactive content and display it in real time. I was outraged at both sets of circumstances. I needed a clearing, a space to moan, a space to protest, a space to affirm the sound of my own voice, even if others would not. I needed a place to lament. I needed a place to live out my vocation and I refused to wait for permission or to be approved by a governing body. This burgeoning commitment, uh, this burgeoning curiosity that is now a commitment uh, that one can find every Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with me often wearing a tattered pink robe where I go live on Facebook and YouTube. Initially, the live streams were brief reflections about the lessons my grandmother and other Black women shared with me while coming of age. Today, they are hour-long meditations on heavy theological concepts like theodicy, the vindication of goodness in the face of evil, or soteriology, the study of aliveness, gender, power, class, race, and respectability politics. A viewer named the weekly feature Pink Robe Chronicle the pink robe is my priestly garment. The virtual community, half coffee house, half church, is a blend of insiders and outliers. Pastors of offline Black churches searching for sermon inspiration, Muslim Black women with Black church roots appreciative of the Black church prophetic tradition that PRC is squarely rooted. LGBTQ plus who do not have who don't have to explain away their identity in order to praise God. Practitioners of heritage religious traditions honoring our egun, which means ancestors, with prayers of gratitude, all here in what Dr. J. Exodus Hooper called, quote, a theologically inclusive, spirit-driven, black sanctioned space of love working, end quote. In this digital hush harbor, I and other innovative creators are reimagining Black joy, Black love, Black affirmation, Black resistance, and sacred truth telling with the offline Black church. We are transcending the margins designed by interlocking oppressions lived out in the Black church. So, 
today in uh, even in as that is a piece that that I wrote to describe um, the work that I do um, around Pink Rope Chronicles that appears uh, in an article. Um, I a few weeks ago I. Um, just took a pen to pad and then well, actually I typed it out first and then kind of journaled it out long uh, longhand in the ways that I would describe Pink Rope Chronicles. And this is what it is today. Pink Rope Chronicles is an online gathering that centers faith and spirituality from a the theologically progressive, womanist, pan-African and Afro-futurist interpretive lens. We are guided by the Nguzo Saba, faith, creativity, purpose, unity, cooperative economics, collective work and responsibility and self-determination. The Chronicles use sacred texts to illuminate and practice the philosophy of Ubuntu. We believe that Jesus was a political prisoner and faith leader who was ultimately executed by a scandalous government. We believe his witness of and to a new way of being in the world that repositions those who are last in first, that redistributes wealth from the center of the margins and provides a template for ethical and just living, liberates us from the fear of multiple deaths. We are ordained clergy, seminarians, graduate students, professors, attorneys, higher education professionals, administrative specialists, entrepreneurs, labor workers, stylists, degreed and non-degreed. We are Christian, Muslim, humanists, priests and priestesses, Bible readers and Bible scholars, preachers, artists and activists. We are gold diggers and truth to power speakers. We believe that all black lives are sacred and that all black love is revolutionary. We are straight, lesbian, gay, transgender, transgender, intersex, bi, queer, and or questioning. We are the people of God. As Pink Rope Chronicles uh, has continued to grow, I realized that we needed space um, after PRC um, to, to talk back to the text. I picked up this talking back to the text um, from our sister, our sister community, The Gathering, a womanist church in Dallas, Texas, founded by the Reverend Doctors Irie Session and Camila Hall Sharp. So we created the clearing to augment Pink Rope Chronicles. The clearing then is a digital hush harbor uh, that augments Pink Row Chronicles to provide more in-depth and critical engagement with selected text. Like Pink Row Chronicles, the clearing is a radically inclusive and spiritually expansive space. As an act of reciprocity in July 2023, the clearing then moved from an open gathering to a subscription uh, platform community. Village keepers meet live after Pink Row Chronicles and have access to a private online group chat, receive weekly audio recordings of the clearing and exclusive opportunities, uh, as well as access to communal thought leaders and practitioners. So let me move a little bit to why I'm calling this stealing the possession of my own life. Um, for in, in the text, Fugitive uh, Pedagogy, I am arrested uh, by this idea of fugitivity. Um, and so I want to read a little bit as I share, continue to share my vocational journey and how I use this understanding of fug fugitive pedagogy to really talk about what it means to be a social entrepreneur and what it requires to be innovative. So you can find this information again in the text, fu Fugitive Pedagogy. According to the author, fug fugitive pedagogy, my tongue is heavy this evening, fugitive pedagogy accounts for the physical and intellectual acts of, sub of subversion engaged by Black people over the course of their educational strivings, creating and curate, excuse me, creating and curating spaces. Fugitive pedagogy in its ancient and modern historical meaning generally refers to the enslaved fleeing from the dominant protocols of teaching and learning and the narrative scripts that structure these experiences. Let me pause and read that back. Fugitive pedagogy 
in its ancient and modern historical meaning generally refers to the enslaved fleeing from the dominant protocols of teaching and learning and the narrative scripts that structure these experiences. The creation of Pink Rope Chronicles can be spoken about or, or that action is a way of fleeing the dominant protocols of a teaching and learning that would suggest that the way that one lives out a call to ministry is only done in a particular space, can only be lived out behind a pulpit, uh, can only be done within a brick and mortar uh, church, if you will, and can only be seen as Christian, um, that a minister, who one who identifies uh, their call um, as a minister of the gospel um, cannot be in community uh, or can, excuse me, not in community, but cannot be be in um, a faith community with anyone other than those who believe like them, for those who practice like them without an attempt to proselytize, without an attempt to evangelize. And so this idea of stealing back my own possession really speaks to the ways in which um, Pink Road Chronicles comes into being as a way of retrieving and an act of Sankofa, of going back to fetch what was lost, as a way of me returning to myself. This description of fugitive uh, pedagogy goes on in this way. That these, as such, the entire, uh, as such, these approaches of schooling is called into question when the enslaved uh, think and plot their own course of action, when their response is flight, when they steal possession of their selves. This is so good to me. Why is it good to me? Because, um, if I can just speak candidly, there are ways in which if folks are really able and willing to tell the truth uh, that we are enslaved to the places where we work and in many ways enslaved to our vocations. And yes, our vocation is not the same as our occupation. Occupations can be considered as um, those things that we must do to be able to live day to day, right? To be able to receive, it's transactional, to be able to receive funds, to be able to put toward what one needs to live. So food, housing, uh, shelters, um, a vocation, uh, which comes from the Latin vocare, which at the root is to call, to be called and to be drawn out into. Uh, for many of us, these vocations um, are, are lived in or lived out within a particular system, within a particular institution. And institutions are, and systems have their own rules, have their own set of standards that sometimes um, uh, uh, are in tension with our own inner code of ethics, with our own inner standards. And so it has been my experience that I have found myself <laughs> or I have felt enslaved within a particular school of thought with the belief that it can only be done this way or with the belief that the call can only look like this. So that as a result of that, that moment in August, 2016, when I was disinvited to be, to, to preach at the church where I was serving, it was a moment um, of reckoning. Um, so what does it mean for us then to consider how we are stealing possession of our own lives? How is it then that we that we retrieve um, what we in many ways uh, have given or what has been taken? Well, Melva, what do you mean? Here's what I mean. Um, in fall 2021, I was, I took leave. I, I was forced on leave, Ashe. Let me speak what my truth is. I was forced on leave. And it was a moment um, of reckoning. Uh, and in that reckoning, I had to, um, I had to ask myself what's next. I have never been interested in being an entrepreneur. 
not ever, not one time prior to then had I ever dreamed I want to own my own business. Not one time, at least I, it, it, it wasn't in those words. I did want to do my own thing. Uh, I just never identified it in that way. Um, I did want to, well, I wanted to do many things. Uh, it was my partner, my spouse, who has, um, uh, uh, <laughs> it was my my spouse whom upon meeting him 28 years ago, told me not only was he an entrepreneur, but that he'd not worked for anyone, nor had he planned to work for anyone. I thought that was the most ludicrous thing that I'd heard um, and instantly checked him off of my box <laughs> because I equated that with this person not about to have any job. This is, uh, no, th th this is not a good thing for me. And so this was never anything that I was interested in doing. Um, I was interested in doing things on the side that would contribute to the salary um, that I was already making, um, anything on top of, but the whole go out on your own and do was just never, it, 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 it never crossed my mind. When I was met with this challenge or when I met with, met with this moment of time when it came to me, I was petrified um, because what I felt was stripped from me was um, really was the illusion of safety. <laughs> Yee, my goodness. The illusion of safety that came from what I believed was knowing that this paycheck was going to hit on this day every month. And I say the illusion of safety because we all know that that many things can happen and that what we think is really a sure thing at any given moment, situations can change. And certainly my situation changed. That later on that December, I'd gone to a um, some kind of event for the holidays um, that my sorority was hosting. And when uh, it was a vendors uh, community and um, a holiday like bazaar with different vendors. And I was amazed as I walked from table to table and I saw these black women, many of them were black women who were selling their wares, beautiful wares. I mean, beautiful candles and clothing and jewelry and things that they'd made with their hands. And, and it was beautiful. And I asked one person, uh, a vendor, I said, let me ask you this. I said, what did it take for you to do this? Like, what did it take for you to decide that you would actually, you know, try your hand, uh, believe that you can make something, believe people would purchase it and give back to the community. And the person said, um, I'm not sure if I can answer that because I'm still having faith or believing that that's actually what's going to happen, that this is a total act of faith. That stuck with me, y'all. And I then begin to think, if it's sticking with me, if I'm sitting here considering what will it take now that I don't have the safety uh, or the assurance, what will it take for me to believe in myself enough to know that I have something to say um, and that in actuality, even though I never thought of myself as, that is exactly who I am. What would it mean then for me to steal possession? What would it mean for me to retrieve me from the system that for so long had given me perceived comfort, what would it mean for me to launch out, if you will, in the deep and actually believe and actually get out of the proverbial boat? These were turning moments in my vocational journey, moments that I was not expecting, moments that I'm not even sure that I welcomed, but moments nonetheless. As a result of that question, I then reached out to 16. 16 folk that I've watched both up close and from afar. These were faith leaders. Uh, these were people who had left traditional spaces, traditional nine to fives uh, to launch out, to get out the boat. Um, and I invited them to two what I called clearings, right? And these clearings were eight uh, eight hours long on virtual, on, on Zoom. And for eight hours, one hour each, each of these conductors uh, began to share with us their narrative, their story about what it took for them to get out of the boat. Hmm. At that moment, um, 
I think it is safe to say that I recognize that I had moved into this full-time entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial space. At the same time that I'm budding and growing and coming into self, my spouse and I are engaging in conversation and um, we are again talking about what it means to live in fugitivity, uh, which again, another way of thinking about a fugitivity um, is, is a way of talking about forging a new path, right? So Givens emphasizes that the very act of education itself, and I want to add uh, not only education, but innovation, seeing education as innovation, that the very act of education, innovation, entrepreneurship itself, the very act of asserting um, this education of Black people for givens amidst the criminalization of literacy under slavery and the surveilled uh, school settings and aggressive structural structural um, uh, 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 neglects after it is a political subversive act. He says that he explains how Black teachers engage in acts of resistance to counter the oppressive conditions and messages of white supremacy and racial capitalism using a toolkit of practices to um, uh, to be able to advance learning experiences of joy and empowerment. I like to then say that um, my toolkit of practices, which indeed is a fugitive pedagogy or a fugitive innovation, a fugitive entrepreneurship, if you will, um, is this notion of Tunis, a way of stretching. I talk about it in my other work as um, stretching the kink, uh, this way that we engage, this way, way that is rooted in the rituals um, shared between uh, matrilineal generations uh, of Black women, um, this, this way or a, a ritual of hair care, wherein the stretching and manipulation of the original coil requires a level of expertise, requires a level of skill, requires a level of creativity, and that this skill is most visible if and when the, the being who is doing the hair is able or is uh, is able to do so without adding um, a stress or damage to the particular coil. So then I am showing up in this space as a social entrepreneur, as an innovator in um, not just Christian ministry, absolutely in digital proclamation, in creating space, in digital religion and Black digital religion, and and creating community that stretches uh, this Tunis, this 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 fugitivity um, that Du Bois would talk about as a kind of double consciousness, uh, which is required when one is two facing, when one is has a foot in a system for one's livelihood, and when one deeply desires to have a foot outside to create one's own system. There is a way in which one has to stretch. There is a way in which one is often a fugitive, not only a fugitive of self, but a fugitive of a system that wants to keep you beholding to only doing it in a particular way. And I am coming to debunk that particular way. The problem then um, with staying stuck in that way, um, I'm going to use uh, um, a scripture actually to, to further illuminate this problem. And that scripture is uh, Deuteronomy 1 and 1. These are the words uh, or Deuteronomy 1 like maybe one through one through six. These are the words that Moses spoke to all of Israel beyond the Jordan by the way of Mount Seir, that it takes 11 days to reach Kadesh Barnea from Horeb. And in the 40th year of the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the Israelites just as the Lord had commanded him to speak to them. And the Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb saying, you have stayed long enough at this mountain resume your journey. You have stayed long enough at this mountain, resume your journey. So what I was coming up against is the way that I had become way comfortable, 
very comfortable believing that I had achieved the level of success uh, that I had actually achieved what I'd set out to do, that I had reached it, that there was really no reason for me to become an entrepreneur. Um, I had become comfortable, uh, comfortable. I had become complacent, if you will. And I'm going to speak about it as a kind of captivity. I had become a comfortable captive, comfortable in my captivity, mm, comfortable in this kind of wilderness experience. Uh, it is the way that I think of uh, those for whom uh, the writer of this text is speaking and how they'd accepted uh, their perceived fate to be wanderers. A journey that should have only taken them 11 days has now taken 40 years. This means that it is possible that their circumstance was created by the generation before them. Well, what do I mean by that? Um, I am of a generation who was formed by a generation who socialized us to believe that in order to succeed in this society, you needed to be respectable. Respectable meant that you spoke a certain way, that you dressed a certain way, that you showed up to your appointments on time, that you did was what was requested of you and even more what was required and beyond. And as a result of your ability to engage in that way, you would be rewarded, you would have longevity in a, in a job or, that respectability um, would lead you to go to school. And after going to school, you would then get a job. But none of the roads led to entrepreneurship. All of the roads led to our ability to be able to assimilate into society in a way that would show us as respectable. And if we could be seen as respectable, we would be seen as human beings. And if we would be seen as human beings, then certainly a system, a system would relax its, 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 its harsh treatment of us. Mm, 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 mm. So there is a way in which my inability to see or to be creative enough to think that I could actually make a living or to be creative enough to actually say that this is more than just a hobby or to be creative enough to actually believe that this is more than just a gift or something that I learned how to do because I watched my grandmother or this is more um, um, really has to do with the way that the generation prior to me, their lived experiences, um, the way in which they believed it was right, because it was all that they knew, to inform the generation after them, which had little to do with standing and creating um, and getting out the mud. If there was anything that we were going to get out of the mud, it was how to get out of the mud, our ability to work for someone else, to take orders from someone else. Now, this is not everyone. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about my experiences. I'm talking about what was available to the to, 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 to the hands of my family, that if you just go, if you would just go be a part of the system, even when we didn't have money to be a part of the system, even when we had to take out student loans um, so that I could be a part of the system, only so that I would get out, uh, believe that I'm called into this vocation that is not about making goo gobs of money, find myself saddled with student loan debt, only to get into a vocation, get a job, that that either doesn't afford one the ability to live at the same time to pay these student loans that there is a way in which that that kept me going around the same mountain the same mountain of um believing in the vision of another institution believing in the vision that if i could just get to this place if i could just journey here if i could just um um do this if i could just earn the master of divinity if i could just earn the phd if i could just get the tenure track job if i could if i could just do any of these things then surely i will get to a place um where i have evolved i will get to a place where i feel good about myself i will get to a place where i don't need anything else and most importantly i will get to a place where i am comfortable You have gone around this mountain. 
long enough. Forge a new path forward. But forging that new path forward is scary. It can be hard. Uh, not it can be. It is hard. It is like I imagine uh, the people for whom this text uh, is told about. Uh, they fa they're faced with the unknown, uh, and they said things while in that wilderness. Things like we should turn back uh, because at least we knew who our enemy was when we were in the wilderness, uh, or or we don't know where we're going, or we don't know what we'll eat, or we don't know where we'll live. And they asked Moses, "Have you brought us here so that we can die?" And that's the thing about fear. Fear will arrest you in your tracks. Fear, for, fear will tell you that's not a good idea. Fear will tell you you need to run back and go get you a good government job. Fear will tell you that you need to stop listening to what Howard Thurman says is the sound of your genuine. And had I done that, not only would there be no Pink Rope Chronicles and the clearing, which is a healing space, there would also be no One Love Festival. The One Love uh, or One Love, our One Love Festival, uh, honors and celebrates African diasporan uh, art, uh, culture, and history through art, through innovation, uh, through entrepreneurship, and through wellness. Uh, it this year will be its fourth year. Um, we are appreciative of the ways in which we have been shown love um, through here in Winston Salem, and now how it is growing. But the one love was created because, in the words of Dr. Akosua Lassane, we recognize that we are an institution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that my spouse and I, that the work that I've already been doing is already an institution so that we didn't have to wait for another institution to give us approval. We didn't have to wait to see if budget constraints would restrict our ability to bring ideas uh, to, 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 uh, to the broader body. We didn't have to wait to be affirmed. Um, we decided to stop going around this mountain. We decided to resume our journey. We decided to be creative. We decided to create the very thing that we wanted to see. And so since 2019, we have done that. We have had the likes of uh, Sam Bazoule, also known as Blitz Bazoule, uh, Blitz the Ambassador. Blitz, his most recent uh, two works, uh, his book is currently on the New York Times bestseller list, The Scent of Burnt Flowers. He also directed uh, the recent reboot of The Color Purple that will be coming out on Christmas Day. He also um, was the director of Beyonce's Black is King. Our first year Blitz came to Winston-Salem to screen his first film, um, The Burial of, of Kojo. Uh, um, we screened the film and then we um, had a beautiful talk back. Uh, and the next day was a musical showcase uh, featuring Blitz and other local talent. talent. Uh, after COVID, after the quarantine, we came back. Uh, Dr. Chelsea Green and the Green Project um, headlined for us uh, RB Sensation, Kevin Ross, uh, and local acts, uh, along with uh, Masiki Scales and the Common Ground Collective. This year, this year we were blessed again by Dr. Chelsea Green and the Green Project, along with uh, independent R&B King Eric Roberson. And in between all of that were our artistic soul conversations, which are intergenerational conversations that talk about art at the intersection of race, gender, wellness, and spirituality. We were blessed with the participation of international and nationally known scholars, uh, local and national um, public servants um, and educators. And this friend, as we think about um, how we are moving towards next year, uh, this uh, 2024, simply reminds me that not only is it necessary 
for me to return or to steal back, if you will, to use that language, the possession of myself in order to forge a new path. It is absolutely not optional. Today, I am back in the classroom. Today, I am um, um, back with an institution. However, I see that as a partnership. I am in many ways partnering with an institution. I'm not on, I'm no longer on the tenure track. And so there are ways in which that I am able to return um, in a way that values me, that values my time, and that also values what I believe in the words of Alice Walker, popularized by the Reverend Dr. Katie Cannon, that I am able to do the work that my soul must have. And that is my wish for each of us, that we would have the opportunity to do the work that our souls must have. And if that requires stealing back your possession, if that requires you to stop going around the same mountains of doubt, if that requires you to see something different and to take yourself seriously, if that requires you to do such, such then I implore you on this day, that you would get out of the figurative and the literal boat, that you would find your footing in this community and others and know that we are standing and we are waiting as we all run towards these kinds of underground railroads running towards Canada in search for our freedom. Thank you so much. And we give thanks to you, Dr. Sampson, for your witness, your work, and your choice to forge a new path. Your stories that you've shared with us inspire us. They call us to think about our own paths and to give us courage to know that we too can take a step. As we move forth into question and answer, I want to give you a moment to catch your breath. But again, I want to allow those words, those stories that have been shared to kind of sink into the virtual space, sink into your heart, sink into your souls, because this is what we hope to be able to provide over our four weeks is just stories, right? People love to hear uh, important concepts on marketing and fundraising. And those things are important. And we also want to attach those uh, key entrepreneurial uh, components to stories because people are able to find themselves relating more. Uh, to real stories, as we all are living a story. So I will open up our question and answer. I have a question that just kind of emerges uh, from this. It's not something that we've prepared. And this is for Dr. Sampson. As, as you've chosen to forge a new path, and now you look back, and there are other entrepreneurs who are on the brink of forging a new path or in the midst of forging a new path, uh, what will be one or two things, practical things, uh, that one needs to be considering and thinking about as they forge a new path. So this is more of uh, you know, the practical entrepreneurial yeah. things that one needs to have in their toolbox as they forge a new path. Um, thank you for the question. I think that you should have um, folks or, or organizations or entities that are your dream, um, uh, they're doing what you want to do um, um, in your dream world. So for instance, with One Love, um, which you can find at onelovefestival.com, um, uh, the number onelovefestival.com. With One Love, I have three, uh, I call them mentor festivals. <laughs> they don't know they're mentoring me, but I call them, and these are festivals that I follow. Well, one of them I had, he, I um, somebody connected us and we were able to speak with the founder, my spouse and I, which was phenomenal. Um, but there are three um, that I kind of model my our festival off of. And so the one is the modeled off of it. The, uh, the one is what I hope to get to. And the third one is um, it's just my sweet spot. Like it, we don't necessarily have to get there. I just I just rock with them. So I would say and whatever it is that you're wanting to do or that you're doing, that there should be like a minimum of three entities or folk who are already doing it that you look toward um, if you have the ability to meet with them, you know, person to person or uh, um, electronic communication um, to do so. Uh, others, uh, another um, option I would say is to um, 
don't be afraid to um, reach out and to say, hey, I want to do this and to take advantage of free offerings. So let me give um, a plug for something that's getting ready to happen that's free. Uh, Monica Coleman and Takia Amen of Academic Black Women's Bootcamp, um, they have, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I thought I hit do not disturb. They, Monica Coleman and Takia Amen have uh, Academic Black Women's Bootcamp. Um, this is, they are offering a free, um, uh, uh, not podcast, but a free session on October 1st for Black academic women who desire to share their knowledge more broadly and who, who have questions about what to charge. How do I set my fee scale, right? It's free. Now that thing, they should have a waiting list for that. They should really have a waiting list. Um, and so if you are questioning, well, I'm not sure, even if you're not sure what you're actually going toward. If something just piqued your interest a little bit, and especially if there's nothing big on your end that you have to give toward it, I think that you should go ahead and do it. Those are the first two things that come to my mind. I love it. There's great wisdom there. Um, well, we have now entered into the time of question and answer, Q&A. So if you are... Uh, watching on YouTube or MBA's Facebook page. If there's a question that you want to pose to any one of our speakers or to each of them, uh, just drop that in the chat and then our tech team will get that to us so that we can uh, engage your questions and your curiosities. Um, and we invite you to, you should have received uh, links to each of the recorded workshops. You're, you're invited to access those if you have not yet already. Uh, but we want to bring our other speakers into the room and, and to continue in the spirit of, of wisdom and experience. Uh, I want to invite, we'll start with uh, Reverend Kendall Brown and then Reverend Alsa and Reverend Pedro. Uh, and the question is, what's the new narrative that you are seeking to write for this world? And I love that Dr. Sampson um, named this, but what was that moment? Like, when did you, uh, when, when couldn't you not do it any longer? What was that push, uh, into this new narrative? First of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Reverend Darnell and Reverend Ashley for this amazing opportunity to our keynoter, Dr. Melva. It's a pleasure to be with you in this space. And, my colleagues, um, I've been thinking a lot about these questions uh, because I'm back in school. I am uh, in the doctoral program at Pacific School, school of Religion. And my, my the focus of my work centers around um, contemplative spirituality and living into um, our understanding of who we are. Um, we talk a lot about the call, and that's one of my that's one of my passions. I spent over ten years working in theological education, developed along with Bishop uh, Flunder, Yvette Flunder. I we developed a program called Project Access, which provided uh, contextual education for Black and Brown queer seminarians. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about questions of call. Um, we talk a lot about God called me to this. This is what I'm called to do. I will die trying to do, living into what God has called me to do. But something that we don't talk about, and this is this is, and this is my own experience growing up in Baptist circles and Pentecostal circles that claimed me at an early age. We don't talk about agency. We don't talk about the fact that this may or may not be something that I want to do. And my journey was shedding. Uh, I love Dr. Melva, the way that you framed uh, reclaiming. Um, my own sense of identity, and and that what that is what this 
journey has been for me. It is about recognizing and taking seriously the fact that I am, I have certain inclinations, I have certain desires, I have certain wants and wishes and things that I want to do with my life. And there are things that I don't want to spend my time doing. <laughs> and giving yourself permission to name those things and to take in 2015, I had an experience that changed my life. I walked into a store, I picked up a candle. I had been having these yearnings that I wanted to do something with my hands. I, I would literally be driving in my car for 20 years. At a stoplight, I'd look at my hands and say, God, there's something in my hands I need to be doing. For 20 years, that, that went on. And one day I walked into a store in 2015, I picked up a candle Candles have always been a part of my contemplative process. Picked up a candle and I heard a voice that said, you can make this. And for the first time in my adult life, I took that voice seriously. And I went home and I got on the Google <laughs> and I Googled how to make a candle. It was nowhere on my radar. But like you, uh, Dr. Sampson, I had been... I go to farmer's markets every weekend and I talk to the artisans and the makers. I had been doing that all of my life saying, how did you structure your life to be able to do what you're doing? And I had been collecting that information for years. So I know this is, this isn't exactly answering the question, but it's, 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 it's how I got to this place where I am, which I think is relevant for this conversation. So um, yeah, taking your creative whims seriously listening to that voice within and taking your agency seriously um, and saying, you know, the, these are, this is how I want to spend my life and believing that God and the divine will make and your ancestors will make a way uh, when you say yes and open yourself to, to those possibilities. Elsa, uh, what was what was that moment? What's the narrative that you're seeking to write for this world? And what was the moment for you that was the final push into taking that step? Yeah, I think um, in some ways, I'm not sure that I have a clear, precise moment, maybe things building up over time. So I, I so appreciate it. <laughs> getting to hear the keynote today, um, especially leading into to answering this question, because um, I think so much of it just described my experience in so many ways, pieces about um, needing to take back, you know, something, take back. For me, I have thought about it more as like space, thinking of it as space creating space um, and kind of how I've experienced existence in my life with this, this idea of space has been um, being in spaces and um, having the sense that I needed to figure out how I fit into that space. So I come into a space and, um, now, how do I fit into what's happening here? And, and feeling from, from very young that this exercise of trying to figure out how I fit into a space also meant that there were portions of me that couldn't be present in that space. And not being for, able for a long time to be able to name what was happening, right? Um, and how these these expectations of fitting into space came from, from different places. They came from um, systems that are so immersed in dominant culture that's telling you what you are expected to be in a space. They came, um, in my experience, from um, my parents and, and that generation about exactly what <laughs> was spoken about, this idea of respectability. 
um, and how you make your space in a space, all the while, like I said, giving up parts of, of, of you to be present. And um, a little bit about my background. I, my parents are Puerto Rican. Um, I grew up in the Southeast. So it was just an interesting culture to be um, figuring out spaces in when um, you kind of are, are trying to hold on to a cultural identity that no one else around you has. So there were a lot of different spaces to try to figure out how I fit in or didn't or how I was going to, going to be able to be present in. And, you know, that carries on into, into the church and faith communities and then as a leader of a church. And um, being one who is answering a call into ministry in a traditional way um, within church, what communities are willing to, uh, in our tradition where churches call a minister, what communities are willing to call, not just a person like me, but me specifically. And so that, that has been an interesting part of the journey. Um, and all the while, again, those spaces, that space of that congregation has, for me, who's been willing to call me, has been predominantly white congregations, which, you know, has its all <laughs> that this kind of same um, conundrum of how you show up, what's the space you're, you're taking up, um, for me, willing to take up or believing that I could take up. And I think over, over time, so much has, has built up and probably um, what has, has been kind of the impetus of that, that final push to um, kind of where I've said, okay, I can't take this anymore. Like enough is enough. I have to take back, like, who, who am I in these, in these places? And how can I be who I, who I really truly am has partly been um, my role as, as a mother. And as I look at my daughter, who is um, now well into her teen years and wanting to empower her to um, demand the space that she deserves to live in, in the world, not be apologetic about the space that has been a God-given right that we each have to be who God has made us, who we are in all the ways that we are that. And then looking at myself and saying, wait a minute, <laughs> how, how am I doing that or not doing that myself as, um, as a human being, um, as a woman, um, as a, as a Hispanic Latinx woman, as, um, a daughter of Puerto Rican parents, um, as a person who's living in different places that aren't used to, um, my identity showing up in the way that I look. Um, and so it really made me have to take a step back and, and it was, um, take a step back to, to name it and recognize it and to say, and to, to recognize the need for um, claiming it back, but also um, acknowledging the hurt and the, the pain that have come with, with this life of, of interacting in spaces in the way that, that I have, I have done or I needed to do and, and have done. So um, it's, it's all those kind of pieces. And in terms of that identity within the church where I serve, um, that's another layer, uh, has been the, the insistence to, to, um, to have people to first an invitation, but the insistence to say um, there are pieces around um, race and identity and ethnicity and that we have got to talk about. Um, and 
we have to talk about it because we have people in our community for whom this is real. We have to talk about it because I'm in your community and this is real. We have to talk about it because um, you sense a call to be um, in ministries of accompaniment with people <laughs> for whom this is reality. And, and you can't continue in a way that, that um, glosses over these pieces. So um, that's maybe a little more uh, than my time, but it's, uh, for me, it's a, it's a thing of layers and thing that has built up over time um, to a point of really quite frankly, um, to get very real, um, it, it's from my, my own well being, too. I came to the realization that this tension was, was very deep, was, I was experiencing, experiencing it very deeply within me in such a way that it was actually affecting my health, my well being, my sense of, of wholeness as a child of God. And, and that's not okay. Um, especially when, when we're in communities of faith that are supposed to be healing places, um, when the place is, is causing harm and, and not healing by God, we need to pay attention. Right. Just go at it, Ashley, or. Okay. Uh, first, I just want to thank uh, Reverend Melba for those powerful, powerful words. I was like, fuego was coming down. <laughs> Are we, have you done an altar calling? I would have been face down waiting for some, I know, anointing or something. Uh, which brought me back also to growing up in a uh, Pentecostal uh, congregation. Anyway, thank you for, for those words of empowerment and affirmation, because many of the pieces you, you mentioned were an affirmation to where God, we feel called, right, to. And uh, anyway, let me compose myself. Um, so... I guess for for me, this idea of discovering um, of of finding a narrative um, for me and the community I am I'm serving, it it it, it wasn't an, an alternative. Um, there is we're still in the process of finding that language that affirms who we are in the intersectionalities where we are. Uh, because as Latinos, Latinx community, there's all kinds of places where we connect and others that were very different. And it, 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 the intersectionalities come in education levels, colorism, uh, cultural backgrounds, history, heritage, land, uh, migratory status. I could go on and go on. And so my community of faith is is an open and affirming church. I can't say that in Spanish. It, it doesn't it doesn't ring, uh, you know, it doesn't sound the same. Abierto y afirmativo, what's, what's that? So how do we say that everyone's welcome? The, 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 I love that piece of no explanations needed here. Um, how do we affirm bodies? How do we affirm lives in a way that expresses and, and, and we can say it in Spanish, but that also we can use it to, you know, 
invite others and it sticks in people's minds. So we're in the midst of that. We use faith inclusive. And, uh, right, because it's, it's easier to say we're, we're in Iglesia Inclusiva. We proclaim a uh, faith incluyent and inclusive faith. Um, so we're we're in that process of finding that that narrative. Um, but it is also because of you know going back to what I also was saying the the space where we are. It, we we are um, in 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 a border. We're very close to the U.S. Mexico border, and 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 border. My bad, sorry. Border towns are by nature like we are literally in this uh, liminal space, right? And that we live into that liminality um, in very different, all kinds of levels: spiritual, geographical political uh and 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 so i guess because we are in liminal space we don't feel like we need to figure it out we can be in the in-betweenness and it's fine because you know our 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 <laughs> Everything around us in our context tells us that we're, we're, we're not here and, and we're not there. And if we claim a, 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 an American identity, it's always hyphenated. So do we need to rush into having a, a narrative that works for us? Or we, maybe we can just stay in, in, the, in, in, in that liminality in that in between this um and a lot of also one of the <clears throat> reasons that we have been trying to find because there's i mean i'm not trying to downplay or not recognize the importance of language of naming things or reclaiming things and 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 calling out injustices and affirming the lives of, of all of our community. Um, um, and so I think a, 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 a piece also for us to, to work on this language that works for our faith community, um, it comes from a, from, a place of inadequacy. And my personal story, I've often have had that feeling of, of inadequacy. And, and when I came from Mexico to the United States, I that was that was I didn't know it then, but that was a big piece of, of, of my experience at church of trying to be, folks trying to put me in this box of because I'm a, a cisgender Latino man uh, wanted me to talk like or act like or preach like or believe the things that my Latino brothers and sisters uh, do. And I said, no, I, I want to go to PSR. Like, I, I oh, darn it, never forget about this light. I'm sorry. Um, I am called to, my faith is not what you think it is, just because I look like I should have. <laughs> so I see. Let me just share this anecdote. I, I make it to PSR, and there is a group that plays soccer. I have never played soccer in my life. I played American football with Mexico, it's it's American football. I, I was in the basketball team and I was in the baseball team. I, I, I was terrible at soccer and at football. And I arrive on campus and there's this group of students there that play soccer in the quad. And they see me and they're like, hey, do you want to join the team? And I said, um, sure, I, I want to make friends. I'll, I'll play soccer with you. Uh, and I still was the best player, 
but um, this feeling of inadequacy and okay, just to wrap it up, I'm having Bible study with who are the core leaders who make up the Comunidad Lima, the, the faith community that, that, that we're building right now. And we have this disruptive moment with some guests that assume our church was like any other church that they have been visiting, Spanish-speaking church. And at the end of that meeting, I address my leaders and I said, you know, it's not this people's fault that they came into this space and they assume we, when they say Studio Biblico, when they say, when they saw Bible study out on the sign, on the street, they assume it was a Bible study. They didn't know they were going to hear the things they heard. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and I said, but when they walk in the space, nothing in this space told them what we believe, what were the values, who was welcome and affirmed in this space. And so I just opened up myself and I said, you know, what I am called to is to build this kind of faith, an open and affirming church in Spanish and develop resources for our community who are often excluded from a relationship with God. And, and our parents started crying and started sharing their, their, story, their uh, family story coming out and, and other parents started crying and telling their story. And then I said, you know, we thought, Pastor, you would never ask. And yet, so that moment we decided to build this community. And yet, my idea of progressive Christianity, it came out of progressive, progressive middle, progressive white theologians that made sense for me when I was in Berkeley, hanging out with my friends. But when I came back to Tucson, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. And then we realized that in order to be, in order to affirm the lives, of those that were closest to us. It wasn't enough to say, oh, you, we love you, you're welcome here. Because there were other layers of oppression and because of the place where we are, we understood that in order to be, to call ourselves progressive, we had to deconstruct not only those theologies that marginalize and, and, and exclude, our, our community, but also to deconstruct the layers of colonialism and uh, doctrine of discovery and internalized white supremacy that we carry with us. And in order to affirm the lives of our family members, we had to also affirm our own bodies and move from feeling inadequate, having an in, uh, 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 of, of feeling inadequate in church, feeling inadequate in our society to a place of sufficiency. And now that we are enough, that we can call ourselves church, we can call ourselves community, that our language is enough, our worship service is enough, the work that we're doing is enough. Um, yeah, uh, where we where we are right now on this journey, because a piece of the conversation has been 
part of our heritage as Latinx community is a heritage. What we have been taught is generosity. That's what keeps our community afloat. And we learned this particularly during the pandemic that we that we are gener generosity is one of the values that our ancestors have passed on to us. And so part of our theological reflection as a community and trying to find that narrative that works for us, we came across Richard Rohr talking about liminal space and talking about liminal spaces as sacred spaces and people experiencing transformation there. And so we thought, okay, if liminal spaces are places of transformation, and we are literally here on, in this border, in this liminal space, living out this liminal faith, <laughs> we need to share this with the church. And that's where the entrepreneurial aspect came about, where we say, well, if we are in this sacred place, let's share this with the rest of God's people. And let's just invite folks to come and experience the, the, the abundance of God's grace that we're experiencing in these spaces. Um, because yes, where there is where there is oppression, there is abundance of, of grace. And and that's what um what what has been what carries it, it's been driving and carrying our community through 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 all this time and so thank you well, thank you pedro thank you all for sharing uh as we try to wrap things up we're going to uh has two questions uh one question will be i'm going to pose to both uh, Dr. Sampson and Reverend Brown. And then we will ask one question for each presenter. As we said, there have been workshops that were released this week. Uh, we wanna make sure we ask a question that's specific to those particular workshops that were released this week. And if there's any questions that emerge from the chat, we will then answer those questions. If we don't hear any questions from our uh, audience, then we will uh, conclude with the questions again that are the specific questions to our presenters who presented a recorded workshops that we hope that you would check out at some point this week. So before moving into those workshop related questions, uh, this question again is for Reverend Brown and Dr. Sampson, and that is, what do you do when people you're trying to work with are stuck in the old narrative? What do you do when you're trying to forge a new path and people seem to be stuck in an old narrative? Dr. Samson. Yeah, doctor. <laughs> hey, Kendall, because like he is my he is he doesn't know this. I'm about to say it now. He's my when I say he's like my behind the scenes uh, mentor, like in terms of of what um he does. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly go around um the mulberry bush to answer that meaning I'm gonna take a, a different route to the question. Uh, I remember um uh, had to be maybe 2018. Kendall, uh, Reverend Kendall, um, please call me Mel because I'm Gary Call You Kendall. Um, in 2018, and um for project access, and you were sharing with me this um that you were about to go off and do um 228 grand street candle it was an idea that had was coming into fruition and um i often in moments of um difficulty or moments of when i'm thinking like this is just not impossible this is impossible like i don't even think this is really a thing i often go back to that conversation and then I go pick up, I'm in my office. So, you know, all your candles are in my spouse's office because <laughs> he goes so hard. I do too. But I often will grab one in, or it'll be right in my, my space. And I remember um, how I heard you then it was only a conversation. It, it, it hadn't even fully become what it is. And so I start out by you know, lifting that up and lifting you up as to say, you know, I'm not sure that I even like to spend time on folks who are not coming. 
Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that it's that it's worth um, the energy and that it is worth the forfeiture of agency <laughs> that that Reverend, because that's what happens when. Um, and so but that is ideal. Right. I know that we are operating in the, the, the practicality of, you know, there will be some folk who who won't come along. You know, what will you do? Um, you know, like I said, the left part of my brain is saying, you know, leave them right where they lay <laughs> as you continue on. I mean, you you absolutely have to do that. And then the other part of me um, says that. Um, I wish y'all could see. Oh, well, I already started giving you this illustration. I was going to say some might see this as, as, as a little violent, but I'm getting ready to show you all. There's this picture. Um, I'm trying to illuminate it, but you can't really see it. But there's this picture right there, right here. And it's of this um, older Black woman. And she is in her yard. She has... Um, it's a rooster and a chicken and um, her stuff, but she has her rifle in her hand. Um, and I put that there. It was given to me. Uh, it was given. My mother gave it to me um, because for her, she said it reminded her of Harriet Tubman. And I asked her, well, why does that remind you of Harriet Tubman? And why have you given it to me? And she said, because everybody didn't want to be free or when they started on their path to freedom down that journey, they got scared and jeopardized the freedom of everyone else with their attempt or thinking that they were going to run back. Um, and, you know, Harriet at times had to forcibly say, you're coming or it's for you right here. Either way, you're not going to jeopardize us getting to where we need to go. And so while that may be a little harsh for some people to digest, I really think that, that that's where it begins and ends. There will always be people who will come with you. There will be people who, who refuse, who flat out can't. And that's their work to do. It's not your work to do. That's actually a part of the journey. You know, people come and uh, come and go into our community often. Often, often, and, and it's a kind of in seasons, you know, I see some people and then I don't see them for a long time, then they come back, then I don't see, then they come, it's the ebb and flow of it. And so I really, you know, I don't have too much to say about that, that expends energy I don't have on trying to figure out how to make folk come. I think maybe if I would pose the question slightly differently, it might be, um, how do I get folks to buy into my vision? How do I get the vision? How do I get people to see what I see? Um, and, and maybe, you know, some are saying like, well, that's the same thing. It, it doesn't sound the same to me. Um, it could be semantics, but how do, and the way that I would do that then is given what I do is really to invite folks to um, take themselves seriously, seriously enough to be able to see um, all that they already have. I think about one of our beloved community members, uh, both in Pink World Chronicles and in the clearing. Some of you may be familiar with her. Her name is attorney Natasha Robinson. Natasha is the proprietor of Legalese Please, um, which is a platform, a legal platform that breaks down legal language. And her tag is we build, we break it down. Uh, we build you up by breaking it down. Um, by making it plain. Um, Natasha, I have watched Natasha um, um, develop and grow and take herself seriously. She left her position um, as a professor uh, from an institution, as a full-time professor as, of an institution, and placed all of her sacred marbles in her own basket. And so the time, uh, the, the conversations that folk had asked her, you know, oh my goodness, you're going to do what? You're going to really, you know, quit your job. You're going to, oh my goodness, it's that respectability again, right? But instead of focusing on what those folks were saying, I've watched her focus on what her internal voice has been saying, right? Which is to continue to do this work. And it has, you know, moved her into opportunities. She is now a frequent um, contributor to shows on Court TV. She's a contributing writer for magazines. She's this, she's that. 
I use as an example to say, if we stopped to give folks this kind of access and space, um, it will interrupt our journeys. It will prevent us from moving ahead, from moving forward. And yeah, I just, I don't have that time to give. Um, if I'm already trying to retrieve uh, my own possessions, uh, then I need all the agency I have and I don't have enough to give away. Uh, I say, I say all, all of that. Uh, Reverend Melville, you picked up uh, the rose and uh, that vase of roses. And that was, it was confirmation for what I was thinking as I was reflecting. A rose doesn't go around announcing, I'm fragrant. It doesn't go around trying to convince people, my smell is beautiful. A rose gives off fragrance. That's what it does. And those who will appreciate it, appreciate it. And those who don't, because they get caught up in the thorns, they get caught up in the thickets, they get caught up. It's not for them. Some people just don't like rose fragrance. Um, so being, it's about being, it's about doing. It's about, it's about being versus doing. Um, a mantra that guides me, and it's not in a capitalist kind of way, because it can be taken that way, but there are riches in niches. There are riches in niches. Finding your niche. A lot of the concerns that we have are because we have not identified our lane. When you identify your lane and when you are living in your lane and when you are living in purpose, the naysayers don't mean nothing because you are clear. When you are clear about who you are and what is in your hands and what you are bringing to the world, you're like, this is, this is all I have. And it is enough. There are riches in niches. Um, we, I'm from Southern Virginia, and a, a phrase that's common in Southern Virginia is who your people. When somebody meet, meets you, they want to know who are your people. When you find your people, when you know who your people are, it unfolds a world of possibilities. So the, my answer to that is to how do you deal with people who don't understand? Because when I made the transition out of traditional ministry, folks looked at me because I had, I had invested so much, but that part of my ego I, I had dealt with. So it didn't, it didn't make any difference to me because I had, I had done that internal work of I know who I am and I don't have to be this in the minds of the people. But when I, when I found my identity and lived into the space that was created for me, um, those, vo those voices didn't matter because I was doing what I was, what I'm called to do. And I've created space. I've created a church in a candle making studio. <laughs> never would have imagined but several times a month folks come into the space and music is playing and they walk into the space and i can see their demeanor change i can see their count countenance change and i talk about candle making subversively i talk about my story i talk about how creativity can change your life how saying yes can change your life and folks have sat in those candle making classes and they've written business plans while I'm talking. Folks have sat in those classes and they have recommitted their lives to their artistic endeavors and the, to their artistic expression. Folks have sent me paintings that they've gone home and painted right after they've left the class. So I have a church. <laughs> But it's beyond anything that I could have ever imagined uh, because I didn't listen to those voices. I didn't listen to the voices that told me that I had to live a traditional path. So, um, yeah. Um, 
agency, list, taking your creative whims seriously, finding, knowing your people, who your people are, and the path will reveal itself. And the, the naysayers, yeah. they don't mean nothing. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. I love it. So uh, speaking of knowing your people, I think what's um, interesting and, and unique, and if you watched uh, their video this week, then you know that um, Elsa and Pedro have been partners in their congregations and communities have been partners in developing this work. And so um, I pose this question to the two of you, uh, and it's a little different than what we had planned, but, you know, Darnell and I, we try to keep it very real <laughs> in, in all of our programming, and we want people to know that you don't have to have it all figured out, you don't have to have all the answers, uh, you can start this work, and then it can go sideways, and maybe it changes shapes, and, you know, may maybe you have to pivot, um, and so I, I just want to invite the two of you to speak to this experience of where you where you're at in this process of forging a new path of of um, community at Lehman and, and possible social enterprise arm of it. Um, what would have been some of the realities of finding out information and and asking questions and what is that I just want to open the floor to you too in that because this is that's a real part we have a lot of people in across the life of the church and their congregations are discerning a response to a need in their context and a lot of times people just don't know where to go they don't know what questions to ask and so um, can you just share a little bit about your experience and on that front It's, uh, I'm going to invite Ailsa to speak first, although I'm doing it, but <laughs> it's funny to do it for you. Uh, oh, my goodness. Go ahead, Ailsa. Okay. Um, well, I was going to ask you to go first. And I think the reason is, is because, um, we're in the middle of it, you know, like there, um, this partnership, um, this, this desire to work together, this, um, coming together is something that, um, wasn't like we thought about for a long time and had plans for, and then a date to start working together. It's something that has just come little steps at a time and organically. And it started with the, the dream that Pedro had of this church and, and the development, the, the beginning steps of, of Comunidad Lehman and them reaching out to First Christian with a simple question of, can we sometimes meet in your building? Um, this is where it started with this question and the board of First Christian saying, well, of course they can, um, and they can just use it whenever they want. And, you know, here's a set of keys and, and it's kind of developed from there. So, there, I think um, there's, there's again, you know, different aspects, aspects of the work um, and that, that comes to a partnership. Um, there's that piece where we have hopes for relationships that are built among the people of the two congregations um, in which um, some of the, the things that we've been thinking and talking about, and we've done a little bit of, is, is creating um, times for people to share stories. So it can be um, not necessarily like telling people today we're gonna share stories, but creating moments and opportunities for that to happen also organically. Um, just having relationships, starting with that piece 
of relationship. And knowing that as, as those relationships grow um, and become more intimate, we know that um, there's going to be moments of certain discoveries and certain um, pieces where conversations that we are doing more intentionally. Um, for example, specifically that um, in two days, our church is uh, having a anti-racism training. And um, this is part of a, a, a already ongoing conversation about um, these themes but this is an intentional step for the congregation that knows like we know that if we are ever going to be good partners with anybody like we at least have to be in delving in these conversations and being stretched in these ways um for example so i think it's a combination um of of some informal organic things that that come together um, some intentional pieces for that relationship and then when we talk about the, the partnership in terms of program, um, which is uh, the border immersion caminantes program and the ways that that informs or, or we hope will um, inform more deeply the work of First Christian and the hospitality center for families that are seeking asylum, um, that, that becomes more of a more planning, sitting down and talking and, and more formal, if you will. Um, but also, our, I think I sp I'm not speaking out of turn for you, Pedro, but our desire is always that foundationally, what's, what's always at the core of what's happening comes from that relational piece um, that is building organically. And, and knowing each other as siblings in Christ and knowing each other as beloved children of God and, and allowing ourselves, all of us, to have minds willing to be broadened in what that means to be um, people who are holy and sacred together and creating communities of safety for others um, within our individual communities and in our work of wanting to share the stories of the border and liminality um, with the broader church and beyond, and even offering those sacred and um, safe spaces for the migrants that are coming. Yeah, and so just to add to that piece, um, we, so before connecting, First Christian always kind of, Opened the, opened the doors like wide open for us to be there. Um, we we were kind of get meeting in different spots, looping around the city, using different spaces, and one experience, well, a repetitive experience that we had uh, with with the other groups was um, was always an invitation to kind of join them and kind of absorb our community and be part of them. And that's why I was earlier talking about inadequacy, but then moving to sufficiency and say, no, like we are who we are. We were clear of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, but this, we never experienced this piece from, from first Christian, like there was always this clarity about accompaniment and, and walking together. And I think in those casual conversations and casual and yet intentional talking with among leaders and both communities, um, there wasn't a whole lot of explanation to do. Uh, First Christian Church has always been a church that has always had a heart for uh, for for opening their churches to migrants and offering hospitality and doing social justice work, et cetera. And we in Comunidad Lima 
like it was always it's always been clear for us that we don't leave out our faith in any other way but uh to 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 live into to live out justice and to share our stories and to share uh, to call out uh, injustice where we see it and when we're experiencing oppression, uh, you know, figure out ways to 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 resist and 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 and, and figure out a different uh, a paradigm for for life and for our communities. And so there was like this natural. I don't remember having to explain any of that. Just our churches kind of say, hey, like you have this uh, piece of stories that we turn into a, a curriculum and, and develop into a program. Mm -hmm. And we have this history and this heritage and 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 uh mm -hmm. and it was like they were already doing hospitality uh, uh first christian by having coming antes there it kind of informs also the work that they're, they're doing it informs us in the sense of understanding uh power dynamics systems etc and, and and it's been It's it's been a pretty um, it's been a fruitful relationship, but also a life giving one that it doesn't stop on on giving and helping us dream and dream bigger. And as a matter of fact, because we started working together, this kind of momentum generated out of that, and we we. Uh, the region now got involved and we we have been uh, developing the Arizona Disciples Border Initiative where we're connecting or inviting more churches to learn about this work and potentially start creating more hospitality centers beyond Tucson. And uh, so it's it, there's been this... Um, out of this initial ener energy, but rather it was rather synergy. I think the broad work both churches together uh, that generated generated more this momentum that is bringing this other interest outside of our both of our congregations doing things together. Um, but so let me just wrap it up with this. I think in part of it, in part why it naturally happened also is because the need is it's right here. Like there are migrant refugees that are being literally dumped on the streets in relation, like with the other colleagues and other, uh, you know, we are in constant conversation with other pastors across the border on this side of the border. Like the, the need is real. There's, there's, there's people literally dying every day out in the desert. There's people being dropped on the streets. Um, what do you do about it? You, you either do nothing or you do something. And in the midst of it, we're trying to figure out <laughs> the, I wish you had a call it, but the 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 formality, I guess, of of the relationship, and yet again, do we need to rush into that because the work of the the work that is that we are called to do is so urgent that we're in the midst of it, and 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 I guess we're figuring out as as we offer us hospitality, as we take groups down to the border, as we engage in conversation, as we do our own work of, of healing and, and um, 
yeah, and, and, and reconstruction, I guess. Thank you all for responding to that question. As we close out the evening, uh, there was a question posed in the chat. Uh, Kendall responded to that question and we will send that question to the person who asked the question, which is very uh, specific question, some feedback. And I think uh, it was in regards to an idea. I don't wanna go too far into details, but the idea around a market for something. And uh, we would never recognize that when we do engage entrepreneurial endeavors, we wanna study the market and make sure there is a need for that in the market. Uh, so that is always foundational when, when launching out and forging a new path, making sure what it is you want to forge, there's actually a need for the path we're seeking to forge. As a way of closing out the evening, uh, Reverend Brown did present a uh, recorded presentation this week, and we want to ask a question, and this will be our final question for the evening. Uh, I think I lost the question. Okay, here we go. So it says, uh, there's no questioning that God had a wild ride in the store for you when you were, when you heard that voice. For most people, they don't necessarily have their business named or national television on national television. I don't imagine that's been the only element to the capacity building and strengthening of your company. What have been some of the learnings and practices you put in place that have led to that? Um, I'll be very brief uh, in my response because uh, I, I want to make sure we have time for others. Um, Number one, uh, no experiences were wasted. <laughs> uh, I'm working on an assignment and, a, and I have it in front of me and I listed in a reflection paper all of the positions I've, I've held. Uh, and these are just some of them in my adult life. Uh, I was a headhunter, recruiter. Um, I was a minister of music. I was an organist. I was a seminary admissions director. I was an associate pastor of Christian education. I was a church planter. I was UCC conference staff. I was program manager. And now I'm an entrepreneur and candle maker. And while all of those have been wonderful positions and there are wonderful aspects of every position, um, there were there were aspects of all of those roles that I constantly felt like I was not wired for, or I was working against the grain or swimming upstream. But when I tell you every one of those positions gave me skills and knowledge and experiences that I use on a daily basis, working in a small seminary with a very little staff, very small staff, having to do marketing, uh, having to do advertising for the seminary, having to do all of these things that I'd never done. All of those things I do now. Working, uh, building a program, uh, a nonprofit program from the ground up, having to build a website with no web skills whatsoever. I built my own website for the business as a result of those experiences. So none of those experiences were wasted. Um, that, that would be my, I'll wrap it up by saying um, that's my greatest takeaway that you can, there's something that's usable from, from every experience, uh, no matter how bitter or no matter how sweet. Uh, it, was all, it was all useful for this journey. Beautiful words and reflection to be able to offer us all as we conclude this evening. So you have heard uh, the stories of those who are forging a new path, and we are honored to be able to hear their witness again and hear their stories. And we're also honored just to be able to accompany so many social entrepreneurs through our cohorts, uh, being able to accompany them as they explore how they will forge a new path. And as we've shared every week, we are in the season of receiving applications for our 2024 sent cohort. These are folks who have ideas, who have an imagination, who are thinking about forging a new path and can use some accompaniment, some peer support, some learning, some intentional time together that they can get that structure, that foundation set to be able to 
create their social enterprise. So if you haven't already, please visit our website at www.mbacares.org and you will find on the website our SENT cohort application for 2024. Please apply. Our deadline is October the 1st. We would love to hear about your ideas and what is emerging within you as you are hearing Spirit speak to your heart in ways in which you are seeking to forge a new path. Again, thank you all for joining us throughout this month. Thank you for tonight's panel, every panel we've had each week. You've been a blessing to us and your stories help transform lives. Thank you again. Have a good night. Thank you.